From the Mansion House to your house, welcome to the United Community Mansion House. Besides being a National Historic Landmark, Museum, and Home, OCMH is a historic inn with eight newly decorated overnight guest rooms with more on the way. We invite you to come visit, take a tour, and experience community in person at the Mansion House. But until that visit, we hope you enjoy this video on historic preservation at the Mansion House. It's amazing to watch and be a part of a group of people so dedicated to preserving the building and its story. So the theme for this webinar is historic preservation. But you might be asking yourself, well, what is historic preservation? And that's a really good question. At the Mansion House, we think of historic preservation as the care, maintenance, and upkeep of the nationally and internationally historic structures like the Mansion House. So in practice, our historic preservation team is doing this every single day, fixing water leaks, fixing our roofs, our porches, our historic interiors, taking care of our collection objects, and even the landscape. So, when you talk about historic preservation, the most important thing we want to do here is keep the building in good order so that future generations of people can experience community just as the first perfectionists did here in the 19th century. As I mentioned before, the mansion house is always being upkept every single day. Indeed, the building has always been a site of construction. There were new building projects going in and out all the time during the 19th and 20th century. Indeed, it's a building in motion. It's a living building that's been lived in for 160 years. So we have here is this panel here. You can see the very first mansion house was a wooden structure that was really right on the south lawn. And it evolves throughout time for the 1862 building here when the consolidation of the uh, satellite communities in New York and Vermont and New Jersey. And again here, they needed more space for laundry and other uh, activities, so they built the Tontine here in 1863. We'll talk about the South Wing a little bit more, but when the stirpiculture experiment, or the planned uh, uh, selection of children's happened in the late uh, 1860s, they built what's known as the South Wing, or the children's wing. And then they also, when the Wallingford community came on board in the uh, 1870s, they added the last major um, <clears throat> construction project during community days, uh, building the new house here. And finally, the whole thing was complete in 1914 when uh, Sturpacult architect uh, Theodore Skinner added the lounge right here where we're standing today in 1914 for uh, events here, uh, the company, as well as the residents. So as you can see, it is a building in motion that has, has really evolved throughout time. Indeed, the perfectionist actually said, our eye is rather pleased and our interest peaked by noticing the evidences of time and the successive stages of progress that passed over the world. Indeed, they love seeing the building evolve and being built and adapted, just as we do today. So now I'll turn it over to Mike, who's going to walk us through the awesome work that we've been up to uh, since the fall on our preservation project. Thanks, Tom. Now fast forward to today's project, our roof rehabilitation at the United Community Mansion House. In the lounge, we have these beautiful panels that our in-house staff came up with and put together and put on display for everyone to come and see. They're very self-explanatory when you come visit the Mansion House, although any one of us would be happy to, to go over them with you. Today, what I want to do is tell you about the priority work area that's taking place out in the Quadrant Angle, which is located on the west wall of the south wing. The scope of work here involves the removal of slate, flashing material, wooden trim, including eaves, fascia boards, and corbels, all of which gains us access to the mansard roof deck the mansard wood framing, and the uppermost section of brick wall located behind the wooden cornice. And when all of the deteriorated materials are removed, replacement can begin. So as Mike was saying, the priority work that's going on here at the Mansion House is on the south wing, or the children's wing of the Mansion House. This whole structure behind me was completed in 1870, but work for it began in 1868. However, even further back when they were designing the first Mansion House in the 18. 60s, <clears throat> the building over there, Erastus Hamilton, who was a builder and architect here in the community, actually came up with plans for a south wing. However, by the time they finished the 1862 house, they had run into some financial hardship and plans had to be shelved. But it wasn't too long because in 1868, they actually retook up Hamilton's plans and slightly altered them because by 1868, tastes in American architecture had changed. Gone were the Italian villa architectural details that were in the 1862 Mansion House, and in came the French Second Empire. French Second Empire architecture 
the main characteristic, the telling characteristic, is the roof, the mansard roof that uh, the community opted to put on in place of the Italianate design because they wanted to show people that they were prosperous and that they were up with the latest fashions in building and architecture. Now, this building was mainly used for the children because, as I mentioned before, the Stuber culture experiment had started to get going in the late 1860s. And this was a process by which John Humphrey Norris and other leaders of the community selected certain people to actually have children. And they would say things like, we want to make an architect or a more spiritually pure person. And they would have a child, and that child would be raised here in common uh, in the children's way. So aside from providing places for the uh, stripper cult children to sleep, to uh, go to school, and to play, it also gave uh, the mansion house an amazing vista of the South Lawn here with this tower, as you can see. It gave them a commanding view of the entire property that they owned and literally made them have a city on a hill right here in Oneida. Now, some of the other things to talk about with the South Wing is it's actually not just one big wing. There's actually three segments to it. There is the, uh, what's known as the, the main block, but then we also have the West Avenue block as well as the Ultima Tool. Those are three separate areas inside the Magic House. The South Wing of the Magic House is constructed in a very similar manner to the main 1862 building. You see you have bricks, limestone, moat, limestone, mortar. But there's also lots of things going on inside the mansion house that are super inventive for the time. For instance, this is the first building with steam heat. So the entire mansion house had steam heat by this point. It also had earth closets, where we're basically like a chemical toilet or a composting toilet today. They were on each floor. And finally, what's most interesting, and the one thing that Mike Mutton talks about, is that there was an integrated gutter system in this building. So all the water was collected in the gutters, and then they went down into the basement into a reservoir. Now, the only access for mobilization and actually working on the priority work area requires entering on the lawn between the Tontine building and the south wing. However, underground lies an arched tunnel. Hence, step one, build a bridge. Structural engineering firm Ryan Biggs Clark Davis was brought in to design the specialty access bridge, which would need to include a weight capacity rating able to handle up to 30,000 pounds. Now, here's Tom with some history of the tunnel. So now we're in the children's house, in the basement. This was once the boiler room, because as I said, this was, the, uh, this was the first time that the Magic House had steam heat throughout, and it all started here in the boiler room. Now, a lot of people think that the basement is scary, it might be a little creepy, but really back in the day, this was somewhere where people were always hanging out. It was a main thoroughfare where you could get to all places of the Magic House through the basement. And one of the things people always ask us is, what about the tunnels? Well, we're going to take you one right now. And this tunnel was built right after they finished the children's house in 1870 so they could access the Tom team. We're going to go take a walk through it right now. But just remember as we go through that right above us is that bridge that's bringing awesome and amazing contractors and materials to the job site, the priority work site. So follow me. We'll go through After construction of the bridge was complete, mobilization would soon be underway and four stories of scaffolding were brought in and erected. We had finally arrived at the point where demo could begin. In accordance with the New York State Department of Labor, as well as the United States Environmental Protection Agency laws, licensed abatement contractors would need to perform some of the demo work. A team from Mid-Atlantic Environmental Company was brought in to do the slate removals along with any affiliated roofing materials that were previously identified as asbestos containing materials in our asbestos containing material roof survey. For example, tar paper vapor barriers, caulking compounds applied to flashings, as well as roof tars. All of this was overseen by an asbestos abatement project monitor from Energy and Environment LLC. After that, Paul Roofing came in and began demo work on deteriorated wood framing, sheathing, and cornice trim, including fascia boards, decorative moldings, and corbels. Samples of moldings were taken so knives could be made to match the profiles, assuring replacement trim made back in the shop would be identical to the existing. With the deteriorated cornice now removed, 
Not only were we able to evaluate the interior wood framing structure, but we also got our first look at just how much masonry damage had been occurring, and there was plenty. A structural engineer was brought in for an assessment. It was then determined that the best course of corrective action would be to replace not only the entire length of wooden cornice and its deteriorated framing, but also the entire top section of brick wall, measuring four feet in height, 56 feet in length, and four whites deep, resulting in a combined rework of some 5,000 bricks. Due to the load-bearing capacity of the upper mansard roof framing which rested on this wall and its compromised structural integrity, the demo and replacement would need to be done in six-foot sections. All of this would lead into quite a significant change order, requiring added time, materials, and of course, more money. Now, before all this added work was discovered, the project had already been facing some challenges, many of which were related to the pandemic and the new COVID variant. For instance, construction companies, like many other industries, were dealing with quite a stressed labor pool. Remember the old adage that good help is hard to find? That had transposed into any help is hard to find. Another COVID-related issue that was happening were COVID exposures within the working labor force. That is, crews that were on job sites working often ended up in quarantine due to being exposed by others, for example, other family members. And if that wasn't enough, production of construction materials themselves had already been an issue and once again was only getting worse. In relevance to our project, Revere Copper right out of Rome, New York had sent out a memo about certain materials that it would not or could not produce for an undetermined time. Some of these materials were already specced for our project, such as 20 ounce Freedom Gray Copper for the Cornish shelf, as well as specialty gutter brackets, which the design for installation needs to be determined before building the new cornice. All these things led to valuable time delays this past fall. However, we were not going to be defeated. After lengthy discussions within our building committee, as well as with our contractors, a change order was formulated for review. Probably the biggest thing we needed to grasp now was the concept that in order to get this priority work area completed, we would need to enclose the scaffolding and heat it throughout part of the winter so that new lime mortar would not freeze. Now you may be asking yourself, why not wait until spring? Well, we asked ourselves the same thing. The truth is there were many factors why we couldn't wait. For one, the condition of the wall itself presented a risk of additional failure, which we could not allow to happen. Two, we were already behind due to previous reasons I had mentioned, and we had a full schedule of work to begin in the spring as it was. Delaying would have put us behind even further. And three, materials. When it comes to purchasing them, they are in a complete state of disarray, volatility, and price fluctuations, which are all too often trending higher. Ironically, like trying to overcome the pandemic itself, we all needed to do our part. We all needed to realize that it's not business as usual, and it may not be for a very long time. We needed to act now. That being said, the change order was approved and the work commenced. In late December of 2021 and into early January of 2022, our large four-story exterior metal tubular structure was transformed into a fully enclosed, fully heated and roofed workspace. On January 17th, masonry contractors from Lupini Construction, who specialize in historic masonry projects, were back on site remobilizing in preparation for demo and reconstruction of the brick facade. By the end of February, the masonry rebuild was complete, making way for the carpenters from Kestrel Construction to finish the rebuild of the underside of the wooden cornice and all its affiliated trim. And soon, Paul Verroofing will be back on site installing the prefabricated gutter hangers we talked about earlier in preparation for the brand new Freedom Gray Copper covering that will cover the top of the cornice. From there, new flashings, ice and water barrier fabric and slates will be installed, as well as new replacement trim and metal roofs on the deteriorated dormers. New gutters will soon follow, thus finishing up the priority work area. As of now, we are on track to roll right into the rest of this $1.5 million phase one roof rehabilitation project, 
which includes multiple buildings in many areas of restoration. And although we never had an official project kickoff, as we were avoiding large gatherings at the Mansion House during peak times of the pandemic, I invite you to come in today and see for yourself the preservation in action. We have a large display of panels in the lounge, as we talked about in the beginning, which describes all the work being done in this first phase. I would be happy to walk you through it and answer any questions. And now, here are some clips of the contractors performing some actual work over the last few months. All right, today's work in the priority work area. The masons have removed four whites of brick, exposing some floor joists. Would be the floor joists of the second story. Get a measurement on those. See exactly what they are. They are a full two and a half inch thick. Ten inches wide. So we've got full rough cut two by ten floor joists. All of which are one foot on center. Hi, I'm Mickey. Uh, the brick had deteriorated because there's a lot of water damage. Uh, and that also had a lot to do with your mortar washing out and doing what it was. A lot of water got in here. So in our freeze and thaw cycle in the great north country here, things swell and they shrink. So that's why it all got deteriorated right away outside of age too. How are you fixing it? We're fixing it. We're using new lime mortar and we're using new brick, obviously. We're using the older brick that are solid uh, for backup. You can see some behind you there. We'll put that back on behind the new facade stuff. So uh, we're tying it into the old stuff with some ties also. And it's going up solid masonry. Where we had cavity wall before, now we're making it more solid. So if any water should at some point down the road infiltrate, I don't think that's the issue you had for another Okay. All right. <laughs> when we lay a brick, this is called the stretcher. That's how long the brick is. When we flip the brick, that is the head of the brick. It's called the header. And what's, what do you make of this here? These like little decorative yeah, elements? They're just on a 45. It's a regular brick on a 45 degree angle. Or they're, they were close to a 45. I, I, I have to match what I had to run with. Uh, so yeah. It's just more uh, ornamental looking, and believe it or not, it's, it, it ties in a lot of brick on the bottom side. So it's not being done as they're being done like this. So it's, it's quite clever what they've done. I'm getting a gallon. I'm just curious. I don't have the bills. Oh, okay. I get the, they give me the gallon tickets. All right. Oliver's getting the bills. All right. So in the change order, they gave us a budgeted figure for a month. Okay. So far, we're good. Well, here we are with Josh from Lapini Construction. Up here laying some bricks and mortar. He's going to explain to us the process in that. Yeah. Right now, from what we demoed before, basically took out a part, so this way we would be able to pull a line from each end. Um, but that's not really too much of the case right now because each time we pull a line from each side, there's a curve in the wall to the bow. So basically, we have to run our leads up on both sides and run our line from there. That's what we're doing right now. Um, as you can see on their wall, they've been putting headers in basically tied to the back side of the wall. Um, and we've been just trying to follow what they've been doing to make it a solid mass wall. Pretty much. Um, right now, we're still going up to the wall, and then soon it's going to be tying back in to where it has those other headers going up. What's fun about the restoration trade uh, is you have to match what's existing. So. Of course, we can't get bricks from the 1800s. And if you look here, you have bricks which are phenomenally skinny. When you match it up to a brick of today, and you have to match that, there's quite a considerable difference between the two. If you go here, here's a better look at it. You can get on there, it's almost... But if you add that as you're going in coursing, it adds up very quick. It adds up very, very fast. So uh, 
Yeah, it's just the way that the brick are fired. If they're made, they're made that way. You don't throw them out, you use them. Uh, even today, the bricks, as you can see, they, they come as they are. But, uh, we have to make it pleasing to the eye. And as you can see, it's pleasing to the eye. So, Mickey, can you tell me about the bump outs here in the wall? You see, you came up six courses here and then bumped out, came up five courses and bumped out again before the 45s and your stretcher bricks and the header bricks. Can you tell us a little bit about why that the architecture is like that? Uh, a lot of it is for uh, the look. It is, just looks sharp. Sometimes it could be because they have to meet something at the very top. So if they started it high, they might have built it out so they could meet their their point at the top. Well, we do have a wooden cornice going back on right? right. so And that could have had a lot to do with things. And as far as the lime mortar, now, you've, you've accomplished quite a bit here so far in this priority work project. How long will it take for the actual mortar to cure once you're three done? Months. Three months? Three months. Three months. And do we have to heat that for three months? <laughs> well, you know, we have a 400,000 BTU propane fired heater down there. Yes, I, I think by the time your, your carpenters are done here, we won't have a thing to worry about. Terrific. Great. But, uh, I'm the project architect for. Uh, this roofing and masonry project. Um, been with Carver Insurance for almost 30 years. Um, and uh, this project started really with a historic structures report from our associate, Ted Bartlett. So we have these different phases of work and um, those phases are prioritized by the damage on the exterior of the building or the interior? How does that work? How do we prioritize these? So there's, you know, roofs and building walls are generally pretty high priority, right? Mm -hmm. they, they keep the weather out. So um, in this phase, we're tackling the roofs. They, they um, kind of met the end of their useful uh, life mm -hmm. and um, are due for replacement. And so that's, that's the main priority is the roof work. And... Uh, the, the masonry is uh, also uh, important in that it's been damaged by the fact that the roofs weren't functioning correctly. So right. a lot of roof water ended up damaging and getting into the masonry walls. Okay. Um, and what would, what's your opinion of the overall uh, condition of the mansion house? How do you think we're doing here? I, I think you're doing great. I think um, the building's really got great bones. Mm -hmm. It's built well. Um, you know, we've had an opportunity to tear parts of it apart um, and look inside and uh, it's it's while it's uh, you know fascinating it's also reassuring that it's you know built well um, it just has you know old building issues it's right. you know needs some TLC right great Hi, uh, uh, I'm Ben Heinz I'm the owner of Kestrel Construction Services this is uh, Pat Cuff who uh, has provided the custom mill work for the project. Um, we've been invited by Pulver Roofing uh, Company out of Utica, New York to rehabilitate the uh, rough carpentry framing and the rough edge details. The custom mill work is, um, is produced in uh, New York Mills, New York at uh, Pat's shop. Um, it's all built out of African mahogany. Um, we've submitted uh, profiles that match the existing profiles, so it's a true, it's a true representation of the existing condition for the restoration efforts we are making here at the United Mansion House. Um, uh, John from uh, Crawford and Stearns has been participating weekly in the review of our work and uh, the re review of the progress on the project, and we're very happy to have participated to date on this, uh, on this campus. So in some of that process, what we do is we take an older uh, existing piece that's on the building and then we send it to a knife company and we have an exact replica made of that profile so that we're able to match everything uh, to the best of our abilities. Um, and then after that, everything gets primed and then gets installed just right onto the, to the cornice. Thank you.